Welcome everyone to the Seven Mighty Moves Book Club. We're today we're going to talk about the very first move. I'm Cheryl Ferlito, co-author of Sortigories. Oh, and I'm <laughs> I'm Nancy Everhart, and I'm the other co-author of Sortigories. And over to you, Margie. Yeah, and I'm Margie Gillis, and I am not a co-author of Sortigories, but I'm friends and colleagues with Nancy and Cheryl, and um. I am the president of an organization called Literacy How, which you'll see on my slides. And when I talk for a few minutes, I'll put our organization's URL in the chat. Um, so thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Margie, for being here. For each of our book clubs, we're going to talk about one of the moves, and we have a special guest um, like Margie joining us for each book club. But before we get, begin, I just want to talk for a moment about the foreword that was done um, uh, for the Seven Mighty Moves by Dr. Anita Archer. It is such a treat to have. To, can you imagine, first of all, being a teacher and having Anita Archer write the foreword? That was very um that I was taken by that. She talks about the big ideas of reading were known, um, but they were not implemented. But there are signs that we're getting better. So she's she's showing us she's showing us hope. She says we've gone down the wrong path, such as a love for reading, guessing at words, discovering letter sound associations. We knew better, but we didn't always do better. So she goes in to talk about how Lindsay author Lindsay Kamini is talking directly to us as teachers. And she ends her forward by making different stops in different grade levels. The first stop is in kindergarten, then she goes into first grade, third grade, and then um, second grade, and then third grade. So I encourage you to have a look at the forward before I'm jumping into the moves. And the introduction also talks about Lindsay's struggle with her own her own child, as well as students that she was teaching, and how it just encouraged her to do more research so that she could know better and do better. So without further ado, we're going to start with move one. Let's get going. I'm excited about today. All right, Margie, here you go. All right. So I'm just here as a guest, and there's a few things I'd like to talk about with regard to move one, which has to do with phonemic awareness. And just before I do launch into some of the key points I want to make, I just want to acknowledge that I had an amazing mentor um, at the beginning of my journey, and Nancy and I share this experience because we both uh, studied with Isabel Liberman. And for those of you who may not know, Isabel Liberman and her research partner at Haskins Laboratories, Don Shankweiler, discovered the role of phonemic awareness in learning to read in the early 70s. So that was 50 years ago now. And when we talk about the science of reading in the decades of research, that's really in large part or not large part, but in some part what we're referring to. So we we have a lot of converging evidence about the importance of phonemic awareness. I wanna just make uh, these four points um, and I'll take each one in turn. First, that teachers need to understand phonology so they can support their students' phonemic awareness. Second, that this understanding that phonemes are what we call articulatory gestures, and I'll talk about what that means and also the importance of practicing those articulatory gestures in the context of words that have meaning. We're not going to do this, you know, devoid of meaning because meaning is absolutely front and center, most important thing. Number three, when we learn to read words automatically, uh, that is fluently, accurately, and, and automatically, the, there is a connection forming process that occurs and that really begins with a speech to print approach to te teaching reading. And my last key point is that phonemic awareness instruction should be differentiated based on our students' data. So number one, this whole idea that phonemic awareness and phonology are related, they're not the same thing. Um, in addition to having Isabel Liverman is one of my mentors, another mentor, two mentors, Ann Fowler and Susan Brady from Haskins Laboratories, who did research on phonemic awareness as well. 
and Hollis Scarborough, who was also there, and most of you know Hollis was um, or is the person that came up with this brilliant idea of the reading rope. So Hollis and Ann Fowler wrote a book called, not a book, sorry, apologize, a, an article called The Fawn Terms, the P-H-O-N Terms, and they defined and explained phonology versus phonemic awareness versus um, phonetics, et cetera. So I just want to take a minute to say very importantly, they're they're related, P-H-O-N. They all have that same um, uh, uh, morpheme, but they're not the same thing. So we think of phoneme, that's the speech sound that combines with other speech sounds in a language system to make words. So all language system has, all language systems have a unique set of phonemes. Um, phonology is actually the rule system by which phonemes are sequenced, right, in a certain order to make words. Um, phonology, uh, spoken language uses the phonology system, the sound system to represent meaning and our writing systems represent both sound, right? Phonology and meaning, semantics. We often think of English too as being morphophonemic. It represents sounds and meaning through the use of um, morphemes. So I guess in thinking about phonemic awareness and phonology, as I said, we want our teachers to understand um, the, the sounds that comprise those words to understand there are consonants, there are vowels, and they are produced um, differently, right? So that leads me to my key takeaway or my key point number two. Um, if you can just advance that one, great that phonemes are articulatory gestures. And what do we mean by that? They're actually motor mouth movements, right? Um, that are produced and speech and language pathologists know this. This is what they study. There's a place of articulation where the sound is made with the mouth, right? With a different speech organ and the manner of articulation. Is it voice? Is it unvoiced? Is it a stop sound? Is it a continuance sound? We actually teach our teachers all of that because we believe very strongly that a teacher must know about the production, right? So that she or he can help the kids um, produce these sounds accurately and they can have fun with it. Here's what I wanna tell you all. You can really have fun teaching kids about these sounds and um, this fun playing games, feeling what their mouth is doing, having mirrors and seeing what's happening, especially for children who are struggling with the production of those sounds, or you know they just can't do that segmenting and blending that uh, Cheryl and Nancy are gonna talk about. So it's, it's, it can be fun and the kids really get these ahas when they do that. So just to quote an article that Janine Heron and I co-wrote a couple of years ago, that these strings of mouth movements and the sounds they produce are actually stored in the brain as whole words. And these words are a code to stand for the real thing, right, in the world. So the word mama is learned as a string of speech bits, not individual, um, a string of speech bits, bits, in other words, the whole word, not um, individual speech bits. And why is that important? Because when you say a word, you actually are co-articulating those sounds. Those sounds aren't really heard as isolated sounds. So we have to help the children do something that's relatively, um, for some, can be difficult, but very important as a, as a key to learning how to read. So uh, the last point is that these phonemes are those gestures that teachers and students need to practice saying in the context of words that have meaning. So we would say a word like milk, that's a tough one. And we would say, what kind of milk do you like to drink? Or do you drink milk or whatever? We're gonna put that word in the context of a sentence. And then we're gonna ask the children to segment the word milk, mm, eh, old and then blend it back together, milk. And again, we can play games. Um, we do body say it and move it and all kinds of fun stuff to help kids practice this, um, this skill. 
Number three. So um, I want to talk a little bit about orthographic mapping because orthographic mapping is something that I think many of us have heard about. And it's a term that's used frequently now to describe um, what I call a connection forming process. And Linnea Airy says it beautifully um, when she talks about this connection forming process. Readers see a new word and they say it or they hear its pronunci pronunciation and it immediately activate, activates it, how the word is spelled, its orthography and what it means. And those mapping connections serve to glue spelling to their pronunciation and memory. That's how they become sight words. So in other words, phonemic awareness is a really important piece of this connection forming process. We're connecting those sounds with what they see in terms of letters or graphemes, and then what the word means. And I just had to put a picture of a brain here because this is the left hemisphere of the brain. And you can see all these areas are connecting. Um, we have where those, I don't know if you can see my, um, no, you can't because I'm not presenting, but you can see in the orange, we have the access to the pronunciation and the articulation. Thank you, Nancy. And you can see the green, the access to meaning right, in the temporal parietal region. And then you see in the back, the visual word form area, the occipital temporal region, where, and right next to the visual input, that little circle in blue, we're connecting those pieces of um, the orthographic mapping process, right, sound, letters, and meaning. And then last but not least, I want to talk just for a couple minutes about this whole idea of differentiated instruction with regard to phonemic awareness, because there's a lot of, there's been a lot of buzz about phonemic awareness in the last couple of years. And I just want to, uh, this is my opinion, um, but it is certainly based on what I've learned and read about in the research, as well as my experience working with kids with pretty significant phonological processing difficulties for about 25 years. So we have phonological sensitivity, which is really sensitivity to the phonological structure of language, including words and syllables, onsets and rhymes and phonemes, down to the phonemic level, which is the smallest grain size. So we want to get to that small grain size because that's what we're going to get kids that's what's going to help kids learn to read. However, some children can't hear those or can't um, produce, can't perceive those individual phonemes well. So that means that sometimes we have to back it up and we have to get them ready, prime the pump by doing clapping syllables, um, rhyming, production and recognition. Also, those can be really helpful. Those different uh, phonological sensitivity skills can be assessed and they can tell us what's the perfect entry point for getting kids to the phoneme. So assessment data, as I mentioned in my, um, in my first slide, the, this differentiated, differentiated instruction has to occur based on the student's data. The second point is, do we do phonemic awareness with or without letters? And again, this is my opinion. I think we do it with both. And um, again, you have to know your students. And I think uh, Lindsay did a nice job describing that. She gave us some case studies that point to different students needing different things. As I like to say, one size does not fit all. So we always have to look at our students' data. Um, I, I, From a research point of view, the sooner we get to the letter, to the graphemes associated with those sounds, the better. And that is when phonics instruction actually kicks in. But for some children, and believe me, I experienced this with my own um, students, the letters were confusing to them at times. So we can play with the sounds of um, these, these phonemes in preschool before their letter recognition is solid. And we should. We should start it as early as we can in those early years. And that leads me to my last bullet point here, which is um, invented writing, which some people call estimated writing. That's, that's Lindsay's word for it. Others call it experimental writing. It's based on what a child 
actually hears and tries to write down, right? To transcribe so that they can get their thoughts on paper. They want to write a note to their mommy. They want to write, um, you know, a letter for what I want for my birthday. And we can get them to practice associating what they're hearing, again, going from speech to print by using what they know about those sounds and how they correspond with the letters. So when you teach sound awareness, phonological awareness, letter sound correspondences, letter naming and letter formation, you're putting all these important skills together um, and kids love it because it empowers them to write something that they really are dying to say. And it's so much fun to see what they're writing and try to interpret what they're writing. So if you're a pre-K teacher, kindergarten teacher, I um, encourage you to get your kids to do that, that fun, fun writing. And that's all I got for the for this little session. I'm happy to answer any questions now or later. And I'm going to put my um, website address in the chat. Well, well, before we move on, I, I'd love to know if there are any questions and let uh, let people ask questions before we layer on um, the next section. So any comments, Cheryl, anything that we're getting there or anybody want to ask? Thing in the uh, chat so, so far, feel free to unmute, unmute yourself or put it in the chat. And it sounds like we have a question ready to go. Um, do you have a scope and sequence of the, um, like which letters should be taught first or which sounds should be taught first, I mean? Um, you I know, mean, lots of people have recommendations for those scope and sequences. And I'll let Nancy and Cheryl take a, take a stab at that. But I would say, you know, a lot of people start with the sounds that are, that are the easiest to produce, um, like the continuance sounds mm, is a very easy, easy-ish sound for kids to produce. So that's a, a variable or a factor you want to consider. Um, and, you know, if there is, there are levels of phonological se sensitivity. So that also would guide your instruction based on data where you would start to do your explicit instruction in phonemic awareness using using that kind of uh, diagnostic assessment. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and Margie, one of the other questions that came to mind as you were talking, is there a phonemic awareness assessment that you think does a good job of helping know where the students are in that ability? I mean, we we used Robertson and Salter for many, many years. It's um, an assessment that looks at the different levels of phonological awareness all the way to the phonemic awareness, segmenting, blending, and um, manipulating elision tasks. So I do like that one. We adapted it a little bit for a research study that we did, but I would say, you know, the nice thing about assessing those levels is that you reach a ceiling and you don't go any further. So you're not gonna administer a 20 minute PA um, assessment because you don't need to, right? The It lends itself nicely to a sequence that you can say, okay, these kids need this, these kids need this, and these kids are ready to go a little bit further. And, and I believe pretty strongly that PA instruction should by and large be done um, in small groups. I mean, there's no reason for you know you to introduce big ideas to a class, but when it comes to the nitty gritty instruction, you really can't keep your eyes on 20 kids um, doing these segmentation and blending tasks. So um, especially for the kids who are struggling, you wanna see exactly what they're doing. You wanna listen to what they're saying. Um, giving them corrective feedback all along the way. Those are really important, um, you know, uh, nuances for teaching phonemic awareness. Well, and, and the question about um, scope and sequence or a sequence of instruction, should, in your experience, the phonemic awareness scope and sequence be the same or align with the phonics that's going on? How do you see those two relating? I will probably talk more about this in the next chapter, but I think it's relevant here as well as you think about it. 
Yeah, I mean, if you're going to if you're going to blend your phonemic awareness and phonics instruction, you would just follow the phonics scope and sequence. And we do phonemic awareness as a warm up, like in a lesson where we're going to teach a specific phonetic concept, a phonic feature. Then we would take words from a decodable text, for example, that the children might be reading, and we would just extract some of those words and do those in the warm up with phonemic awareness, having them blend or segment some words. Again, sort of priming the pump. They're going to see those words, hear those words in the text. We want to make sure they know what those words mean. Um, and so, in that case, you would be following a similar scope and sequence. Uh, you know, that's again my opinion, because you are going to want to link phonemic, the phonemic awareness instruction to the phonics. Thank I you. love that working backwards from the decodable text. Yes. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, Rebecca is asking if you can put the link to the assessment in the chat. And if not, maybe send it and I'll put it with the show notes. What would be better? Or is that maybe not a free can, assessment? I'm not no, sure. I can, I can put that. I can certainly put that in the chat. Um, okay, thank you. And then, you know, there was a question about David Kilpatrick's Equip for Reading Success. Again, we've we've used that with teachers, especially teachers who are in um, interventions with kids um, where they need that, you know, phonemic decoding, phonemic proficiency, and they're really struggling with the orthographic mapping. Those one minute drills seem to really help because it's really, again, sort of priming the pump for what they're going to be doing later on in the lesson. You're welcome. Other questions either in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. Well, maybe if we go forward, there'll be some more questions. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Thank you. Oh. Well, thank, thank you, you, Margie. Um, so as we said in our opening session a couple of weeks ago, uh, Cheryl and I were very interested in Seven Mighty Moves um, because of, whoops, why is that? This is jumping ahead on me today. Um, because some of the things that um, Lindsay said in the book really connected with our work on sortigories. And uh, certainly this quote that students need to be aware and consciously think about the individual sounds as Margie was just describing of our language is key. And we're trying to help students um, learn those 44 phonemes that mostly people count them as 44 um, sounds in, I know you're wondering what's happening, but my slides are jumping ahead without my touching them here. Um, and so what we have done is we have translated um, getting those 44 phonemes accomplished into our scope and sequence. And uh, back to Kathleen's question a few, from a few minutes ago, um, a couple of things that were important in putting the scope and sequence together, in addition to what Margie said, is separating the vowel sounds that are similar. So we don't do a ah and ah right away. We split them up and go to i next. We also try to avoid uh, putting um, sounds that are voiced and voiceless together in the same module so that students aren't getting confused about that point of articulation and manner of articulation. So a scope and sequence is serving a lot of purposes. And one of those purposes is to roll out the speech sounds in a systematic way that tries to avoid confusion. And on our, our website, you can see our scope and sequence and see how that possibly aligns with the programs and materials that you use. In our program, the first row is where we take on uh, the topic of phonemic awareness. And specifically, we do that in the first two activities, sound match and map it. Um, and because of the importance of mastering um, and getting very automatic and proficient with phonemic awareness, this is blocked practice. We keep doing the same kinds of things again and again, um, actually have more items per activity so that we provide that, uh, that blocked practice. We're not gonna talk about the other rows because they're not relevant to today. And 
Another quote from Lindsay, since phonemic uh, level skills directly support reading and spelling, they should be given priority. And um, you know, Mar um, Lindsay was all about what are those mighty moves? What are the things that are, are so critical to changing in our practice? So our activity that works on initial phoneme segmentation is sound match. And I thought we might take a moment and just see how that works. Um, and here we go. In the sound match, the focus is on initial sound isolation. The first match is between the initial sound in a spoken word and the initial sound of a picture cue. The second match is between the spoken sound and the letter or letters that are used to spell the sound. Before you try it, click here to see an example. When you are ready, click try it. So we will try it. And, and one of the reasons that Cheryl and I were interested in doing this book club based on the Mighty Moves is we hope that these activities will help teachers also have ways to approach teaching the things that are in the book and, a, and to provide a kind of fun and interactive way to practice them. So let's take a look at the activity. Gap. Which picture starts with the same sound as gap? And because some children might not know the names of the animals pictured, we have a inchworm. We can dog, goat. So I'm supposed to be listening for the word, the same sound uh, as gap. As gap. And Which that, picture starts with the same sound as gap? And I think that would be goat. So I'm going to click on that. The letter G spells G. Van. Which picture starts with the same sound vulture. as van? Okay, and I click v vulture, v van, so I'm going to do that. And so on. I'm going to go more quickly just so the we The letter V spells V. Dig. Which picture starts with the same sound as dig? The letter D spells D. Gasp. Which picture starts with the same sound as gasp? The letter G spells g. In. Which picture starts with the same sound as in? The letter I spells i. And one of the things that you'll notice. The sound is ah. I'll come back. The letter A spells ah. The sound is i. That's right. The letter I spells i. The sound is d. Great. The letter D spells d. The sound is g. And if I needed to hear the sound again, I can hit the The microphone. sound is <clears throat> g. Correct. The letter G spells g. Okay. And I think we can get out of this. Whoops, maybe not. I'm not sure why it doesn't want to be happy here. There we go. So in this activity, we made the decision um, kind of along the lines of what Margie was saying as to whether to associate the letter that represents the sounds. And we decided to make that a part of um, a part of our activity. And uh, so next uh, point we'd like to make is that Lindsay talked about a couple of uh, strategies for success um, using manipulatives. And in uh, in Sortigories, what we have done, um, because it is a, a web-based product and it, the manipulatives here or the ac action here to make it concrete um, is to tap on the boxes for the number of sounds. So in 
in our next activity, Map It, um, we do segmentation and students will tap the number of boxes for the number of sounds that they hear. Um, we also, uh, and we'll talk more about this next, uh, next session, um, which is that we also apply that analysis to the heart words or the high frequency words for which students might not know the phonology yet, the, the sound of spelling. Um, so we do and do the same analysis though, we'll still tap one box for even though the in that, even though we haven't, uh, the students haven't learned that yet. Um, and then we're very big on the idea of chaining. Um, I want to just go back and, and whoops, go back one. Um, and if in map it for manipulation, um, we say the word spell and they tap the number of boxes for the number of sounds in spell. And then you'll notice that we're already modeling um, and they've already been taught this also uh, by the module that this is in, but that the letter the sound rather ooh, is represented by two L's when it's in that last position. So they're beginning to see some of those patterns modeled for them. But then if we say change spell to spill, the phonemic analysis is where did that sound change? And then we actually, they would tap on the box and then they would see uh, that change uh, occur. This is not happening simultaneously in the actual activity. And then um, we also continue with this idea of chaining and changing uh, words. This is so spooky why it's going ahead, um, that we do the same idea in build it and we have a little build set. Change set to fat. Change fat to cat. And that chaining process really is dependent on hearing the first word, listening to the word that we're changing to, figuring out where the sound has changed, what the sound changed to in order to, to build that word. Um, and this again is an activity that bridges from the phonemic awareness to the phonics and we need to have uh, that foundation to do that. And then um, in sortigories, we've talked about the fact that we have uh, tried to deal with all the layers of language around a, a given word. And in terms of the phonemic awareness, we are really at this very beginning point where we are listening to the sequence of sounds and identifying, tapping them out in, in, uh, in terms of how many sounds uh, that are that students hear. Um, what we've also illustrated is that it's, that allows us to do the sound to, um, to spelling correspondence. And we do refer to it that way as sound to spelling because that is a real practical way for students to hear what they're doing. Um, and then the rest of these uh, parts are dependent on being able to do this these first couple of um, steps really well and automatically. And for sure, um, our work in sortigories um, with phonemic awareness falls in the decoding side of the simple view of reading, um, because we know that that, as I just said, needs to be automatic and accurate uh, for us to be able to put a number in that side that will add up to ultimately to good reading comprehension. So those are some of the ways that sortigories um, is uh, supporting and allowing uh, for purposeful practice with phonemic awareness. And Cheryl, would you want to add anything to what I said about that? Um, no, thank you. Thank you for sharing. I would just encourage, regardless of your interest in sortigories, to go on our website under Try It. 
Because if phonemic awareness or the ability to segment speech sounds is new to you, you could try a couple activities on our website under Try It. Go through level A and level B to see different levels, and it will give you some practice on doing that just in your own comfort rather than in front of students. So um, thank you. We do have a question in the chat um, from Meredith. It's a, it's question curious about Margie and other thoughts on rhyming since rhyming activities appear to be less predictive of reading achievement later as compared to other skills how much rhyming work really makes sense I see teachers spending perhaps too much time on rhyming and not enough time on segmenting and blending because they see rhyming as a prerequisite um, that's that is that is I, I agree with her I'd love to hear Margie's thoughts and anyone else that wants to chime in yeah, I, I'm happy to respond, and then certainly, um, Cheryl, you and Nancy can weigh in, or or other teachers as well on the on the um, in the chat or not in the chat, but in this conversation that we're having. Um, I agree that rhyming is definitely something that have you know kindergarten teachers particularly I see spending a lot of time on it because if a child is stuck, the idea is they can't move to the next level, and that's not true. Um, although I will say rhyming is, you know, sometimes can be a red flag because some children who have difficulties with phonological processing, which is um, certainly phonological processing is a very important thing to be able to do when you're reading and spelling. And so if a child at age three or four can't rhyme, it's a bit of a red flag. But when I say that, I'm saying that because, you know, just think about it and know that that could be a child that might have difficulty with other sound um, sound uh, tasks, sound related tasks, but it's not a prerequisite. Many children can go on to learn to read and never know how to rhyme. So don't get stuck on that. Um, as I said before, phonological sensitivity helps prime the pump for phonemic awareness, but is not necessary that kids go through all those levels. And if they can get to the phoneme level, then you're not gonna spend time at that um, larger grain size. It's because it, it doesn't transfer to reading and spelling. Thank you, that is very helpful. Um, there's another comment, it says in addition uh, to the excellent guidance of Dr. Gillis. There's a brief article by Dr. Motes and a wonderful resource. So there's a link in the chat from Pam Kastner, which we always appreciate. Thank you, Pam. Yes. And Sarah said she didn't see a free version of the PA assessment, but there's a link to the paid version. I'm assuming that might be the assessment that you talked about, Margie. You know, I, I, um, looked for Robertson and Salter and we adapted it for a research study, but I am going to put another one in here that I think okay. is very, it's very similar. It's one that Nancy Mather um, and colleagues uh, developed a number of years ago and revised. So hopefully, uh oh, says access. To, oh, is this it? it? Says access to file doesn't want to go for some reason. Don't ask me why. Restricted by my account administrator. Hmm. If you Google P A S S. That stands for, hold on, let me see. I don't want to misspeak. That stands for Phonological Awareness Skills Screener, P-A-S-S. -S. And again, it um, was written by Nancy Mather and Blanche Podosky and a couple other colleagues. And um, if you Google it, I'm sure you'll be able to find it. P -A -S -S. And I, I can put that with the recording as well. Thank you, Cheryl. Welcome. Any other questions, comments? Uh, let's see. Oh, I had another, here's this from Heidi. I had a conversation with another teacher at my site in the letters manual, unit two, page 97, says that rhyming ability is not as strong of a predictor of reading success as other phonemic awareness. And then she posts a blog post from Tim Shanahan. Um, it sounds like this is the part of phonemic awareness skills, but not a strong predictor of reading ability. Yeah, I think that's kind of old thinking. I think we really did think that we had to teach rhyming first and that some of 
Um, actually, the research, I think, has been out for a bit, but we're becoming more aware of some things that didn't make it research into practice, into classrooms as quickly as we would have liked. So that, that's a very good point. And, and just to, to add to that, Cheryl, remember, rhyming is not phoneme, has nothing to do with phonemic awareness, because a phonemic awareness is hearing those individual or perceiving those individual phonemes and rhyming. Right. Rhyming has a vowel and consonant or consonants that come after it, the rhyme unit. Um, so that's, you know, a chunk, you know, larger grain yeah. size versus yeah. the smaller grain size of the of the phoneme. I agree. And Dr. Pam Kessner is saving the day. She said the author of the pass is Nancy Mather, and the link is in the chat. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And I... Okay. I think relative to this conversation about rhyming, I think uh, looking at Lindsay's book on page 20, where she talks about onset and rhyme and how it relates to, to this topic might be of interest to just take a look at the relevance of, of that. It's not the same as rhyming, uh, coming up with a rhyming word, but there's some, I think that might be relevant. That's all. So that was page 20. And there's also a question about a cadence with, let me get to that question. Would you consider a cadence a good assessment to measure phonemic awareness? I absolutely would. Me too. A cadence, anything, I want to say yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to jump in with the conversation about rhyming. Um, working for over 15 years with students that have dyslexia, the thing about rhyming is that it is that idea that it's hard for them to hear. And if you work on rhyming and work on rhyming, you're not improving their ability to decode, but you can help them work on blending, segmenting, and then, you know, obviously mapping it to, you know, phonics is going to support and help them improve reading and spelling, but they still may never learn to rhyme <laughs> because they cannot hear it in that way. So I think it was really a good question, but also a great explanation, Margie, that you said about it being yes. separate from phoneme work. So yeah, that's great. Well, I think we thought that because you had to pull off the initial sound to often to come up with the rhyme that you were on your way to phonemic awareness by rhyming, um, but it doesn't carry through. That's, uh, that's the downside. Thank you for that. Uh, Right. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Another question from Melissa. Would Dibbles work for assessments as well? Yeah. So a cadence is Dibbles next. And then there's Dibbles eighth edition. And that one is um, published by the Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of Oregon. So they're very similar. There's some differences. That's why it's the eighth edition compared to Dibbles next, which is um an earlier edition but they're they're both they're both great they're very similar um they just have different subtests some a couple of different subtests thank you for that margie there's no shortage of uh, assessments for phonemic awareness uh janine is saying how about the uh, assessments from core learning absolutely we'll have dr dale webster with us as one of our vips later in the session um so yeah there, there's a lot of good assessments and Several are free. Yeah, and think of them as, as diagnostic assessments because the dibbles have are screeners. So the subtests on the dibbles are screening. You're not going to have as many items per sub skill as you will on a diagnostic assessment like the core and like the past. So you're going to get um, more diagnostic data, which is important if you've already recognized through a screener that the child is at risk because of phonemic awareness difficulties, then you're going to want to dig deeper, as we say, and administer a diagnostic assessment like the core. That's helpful. That is helpful. It's important to know the difference between the two. Um really great comments in the chat. Thanks everyone. Uh, are there other questions or comments? Feel free to write them or unmute yourself. We're happy to have more conversation. Okay, I think we have some thank yous coming in there. 
Oh, Jen says they use Dibbles 8. It's great. Yep, there's lots of different versions. So our next book, we're going to take Labor Day off. Yay. Um, our next book club is um, on a month. They're all on Mondays. Um, the next book club is on the 11th, Phonics and Decoding. And I believe that's with Dr. Pam Kastner. We don't have our VIPs listed. Do I have that right, Nancy? You absolutely do. Right. Okay. So we have um, Pam in the house. She's just visiting with us and helping us in the chat, which we appreciate. Um, then on the 18th, we have Decodable Text and Sight Birds. And that's with Jill Lauren from um, Whole Phonics. And then for move six and seven, fluency and comprehension, we have Dr. Dale Webster from Core Learning, which we talked about in the chat a bit. Um, so we're excited to continue this conversation with you all. I will be sending out the recording with a few show notes of things that are in the chat. And we're here for you. So if you have more questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Keep, oh, go back one more, Nancy. That's a little too fast. Okay, so I did put um, the free trial in the chat a bit ago. I don't think that's on my thing. Okay, so you have the QR code there for the free trial. You can register. Well, you're already registered, so you don't have to do that. But if you don't have the book yet, I'm hearing it's coming in much quicker now. So you shouldn't have as much trouble um, getting the book if indeed you're still looking for that. Um, hopefully that's starting to come in more readily. And, and I would like to just add that um, for those who might be interested in more information on phonemic awareness and phonics than Lindsay was able to cover, um, the Literacy How Professional Learning Series um, has a whole book that's focused on that. And if you go to the Literacy How website, you can see the, the books there. Um, and you could also go to Amazon and look it up up there. My error that we didn't get the cover here on on this slide that's uh an oversight sorry margie um but i would like to make we'll put it we'll put those links in the show notes as well i'll write that down you can go to the next slide i put the um free trial in the show notes i mean in the in the chat so we're good there contact information for all of us oh someone just said Pam, I love the Literacy How books. Oh, and Pam put the Pam put the link in there for us. She's got us covered, man. Shannon said, I love Literacy How books. Yes, Shannon, we agree with you. They're really great books. Um, they're just, if you don't know about them, check them out. They also have, although not related to the chapter, but it's very popular, a syntax um, series going on, on that's more related to later in the book, but that, that I'm hearing really great things about their syntax class. Um, the online course, yeah. The online course, yeah. Anything else, feel free to unmute yourself, share a comment, a question for Margie. It doesn't even have to be about phonemic awareness. If you have other questions, we'd be happy to help you if you know the answers. I, stop I also have um, this article that should be in the public domain because I just found it on Google Scholar, the article that I referenced earlier by Hollis Scarborough and Ann Fowler on the font terms. I really think it's a great article um, and I can't get it to go into the chat for some reason, but I'm going to send it to Cheryl and Nancy. Yes, send it now. Uh, yeah, I'll put it in the recording notes for sure. Thank you for that. Yeah, All right. Okay. That Very good. All right, then. Anything else? Feel free to unmute yourself. Christine is saying she loves the Literacy How books and the Syntax Online class, hoping to have more. Yes, for We're sure. Working We're working on it. We'll have some very soon. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Pam says she has the link if we need it. Excellent. Oh, that was a direct message. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everyone. I'm gonna stop recording and then sometimes people will talk after that happens. So I'm gonna stop recording and we hope to see you in two weeks. No, no book club on Labor Day because we want everybody to have a great day.